And uh, thanks so much for this invitation to do this. I'm very, very happy to be here. I uh, learned a lot at the workshops. I thought the two workshops I was able to go to were just great. Very, very impressive people doing very impressive things. So uh, as, as some of you know, this, I'm retiring uh, this now, <laughs> officially, this week. Uh, so this is sort of, in a sense, my last official thing in Ames. And it's very ha I'm very, very happy to be able to go out on something like this. Uh, and especially, and especially that it's, uh, as again, as most of you know, or all of you know, uh, it's the 200th birthday of Uncle Carl today. <laughs> so it's nice to have a chance to uh, celebrate it with a community of people like this. Uh, okay, so now that said, I also want to say that I certainly am aware that many things about the world have changed since Marx's day. Uh, and it's not as if we can go to Marx and find uh, prefabricated answers to all the questions and challenges we face today. Uh, but it does seem to me that he got some things right about our world and some things that are right that are very important and for us to remember. Now, uh, this is supposed to be limited to 45 minutes, so obviously I can't do a complete uh, list of all the things that I think he got right. Uh, but there are five I want to mention. Uh, some of them I'll have to talk about very quickly, uh, just for the sake of time, but I, uh, I think they should at least be acknowledged a little bit. So let's start with what in a way is the big one. Uh, almost everybody thinks uh, that the point of an economy is to serve human beings. Uh, almost everybody will say the point of a capitalist economy, like for all economies, is to serve human beings. Uh, and, and some people think it can do that more or less automatically, uh, just by letting the market work its wonders. Uh, some people think it leads some nudging by the government to come to that conclusion. Now, Marx had a different view. So Marx's view is that if you live in a world where social reproduction is a matter of things circulating in the world, things, things in the form of commodities that are produced and sold as commodities for money, uh, then in that sort of world, something new emerges in the social world that is invisible to us. Uh, it's capital. Now, people talk about machines as if they were capital. People talk about humans' ability to labor as if it were a type of capital, but really, that's, that's not capital. Those things aren't capital in themselves. What capital is is an organizing principle of the social world. It's a special sort of thing, quote unquote, that is an alien power above us in a way, in a real way. Uh, and the point here is it has its objectives. It has its goal, right? It has its good, right? It has its wants. Now, this is a weird way of talking, but Marx thinks we live in a very weird world where through our human action, there's something that's not human that is really pushing the society down a path. Uh, and it's pushing it down a path because it has to attain its goal. And its goal is to start with a particular amount of money at the beginning of a process and then end the process with more money than it started with. And that's the goal of M must become M prime. The initial money that you start off with must become more money. And that organizes our social life. Right? That goal, capital's goal, has more importance than human purposes. And human purposes and human well-being and human flourishing will be sacrificed whenever it gets in the way of capital meeting its goal. Now, what Marx does for us, it makes capital, in that sense, visible. And all other social science, as far as I can tell, capital's invisible. Right? That sense of capital is invisible. Now, we still live in a world that's organized by that imperative, M must become M prime. Uh, and so we can still learn about our social world and its dominant organizing principle by reading Marx. So that's the first thing I think he got right that's still of importance to mention. The second thing I think he's got right is one that came up a lot in the workshops, and uh, it's worth just keeping in mind. Uh, people look at our social world and compare it to a world of slavery, a world of serfdom, and they say, this is a world where there's freedom, there's equality, and what's going on in the market is that free individuals meet as equals and make agreements, make contracts for the sake of mutual benefit. And again, maybe that happens automatically, uh, in which case you're on the right. Uh, maybe it le needs some nudges from government to happen, in which case you're on the progressive side. Uh, but the thing is, if you stop there, you don't have the most important part of the story. If you live in a world that is money directed, right? If you live in a world where the things you need to have even a minimal, acceptable, minimally acceptable standard of life are commodities that somebody else owns and that you need money in order to get access to these things that meet our needs, well then having to get money isn't a free choice, 
right? It's a, it's a social necessity that we are coerced to do. And if, we don't, if we're not born into the world with adequate reserves of money capital already, then how are we going to get the money that we need to meet our human wants and human needs? Well, we're going to have to take our human ability to labor and treat it like a commodity, put it up for sale, and hope that somebody will buy it. Well, who will buy it? The people with money capital to invest. So we're coerced to do this. So what looks like freedom and equality, if you just look just a little bit closer, a little bit deeper, that freedom is, 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 it rests on the co coercion of having to sell our labor power, our human capacity to act to somebody else. And that equality turns out to be a form of class inequality and class exploitation. And it seems to me that's as true today, where 70% of people working full time in America say they hate their job, uh, that this structural coercion and structural exploitation is as deeply rooted in our society as it was when Marx wrote. So that's the second thing that I think should be mentioned. A third thing has to do with his theory of the state, his views on the state. Again, many people realize there are basic problems, fundamental problems in capitalism. Uh, but the easy thing to say is, if we just had the right government, if we just elected the right people, if we just had the right public policies, uh, we could make these problems go away. Uh, so it's our fault, because we don't have enough political will yet uh, uh, to change the thing. Uh, OK, uh, it's true, it's true that the state, and Marx is very clear about this, uh, the state has a certain open-endedness to it. Uh, if you read Marx's journalist, journalistic writings, you read his political essays, it's not like he thought what capital wanted in any moment in time is going to determine what the state does or anything like that. There's a range of possibilities, a range of choices in public policies uh, that different states can adopt. And Marx is also very clear. Uh, some of them are more rational and more humane than others, uh, as we can see today. <laughs> uh, but that said, uh, the one thing Marx was very clear about is, uh, in a capitalist society, the state will be a capitalist state. And what that means is, this open-endedness is going to be restricted, right? There are certain types of things that will be possible within a capitalist state, but there are certain types of things that are going to be excluded in principle. So for instance, the first two things I mentioned, right? There's nothing the capitalist state can do about the fact that in a capitalist society, the ultimate goal, the ultimate purpose, the ultimate good is the goal, purpose, good of capital, right? That M go to M prime, that more money be accumulated at the end of the process than the beginning. Capitalist state can't do anything about that because that's a defining feature of what capitalism is. There's nothing the capitalist state can do about eliminating the restriction, the coercion that underlies labor markets, right? That fact that we are forced to go sell our labor power to somebody else and then who will then use us as a means for their profit, right? Uh, there's nothing the capitalist state that can do to, to eliminate the alienation that defines capitalism. So however much we want rational and humane policies, uh, Marx taught us we should always realize how limited they will be. All right, so those are, those are sort of some basic ABCs about the Marxist view. Now, a fourth point I want to mention, I'm going to talk about it just a little bit longer. Uh, the fourth point is that Marx foresaw in the mid-19th century that capitalism would eventually reach some sort of historical limits. Now, he didn't mean by that, as far as I can tell, that there would be some ultimate co complete collapse or breakdown of the capitalist system uh, just automatically. Uh, capitalism will only be dismantled through collective political action. But what he did mean was that through capitalism's own development, uh, its dynamism will tend to erode over time. Now, what did that mean? Well, I think one obvious thing it means is uh, the environmental problems that were only beginning to show up here and there in Marx's day. Marx anticipated that capitalism will eventually bump up against environmental limits. Uh, why is that? Just the obvious reason. If you have a society that's based on accumulating as many profits as possible, as fast as possible, well, how is it going to do that? It does it by producing and selling and consuming as many commodities as possible, as fast as possible. If you have a social system that is entirely based on producing, selling, and consuming as many commodities as possible, 
That type of society will inevitably, and again, it really doesn't matter what the state does, it will inevitably uh, deplete natural resources at a faster rate than the planetary ecosystem can replenish them and generate waste at a faster rate than the ecosystem can process those wastes. Now, that's not going to destroy capitalism in itself. In some ways, that can be a spur to capitalism because it gives capitalism new areas of investment to deal with environmental problems and, and the disaster capitalism. Uh, you know, disaster events in the ecosystem are great for capital because it gives it new places to invest in. Uh, but over time, over time, this is eroding whatever creative energies capitalism had, right? Whatever power it had to mobilize human creative intelligence uh, in a positive way. Uh, and it did have some ability to do that. But over time, its ability to do that is going to erode, Marx thought. And again, one reason will be because it keeps coming up against these environmental limits. Now, another way that capital will come against its own internal limits is something I want to talk about for, you know, most of the talk could be about that. And this goes back to trying to understand our present historical moment. Because, uh, again, that's the title of the talk, and, and on the 200th birthday, that's the whole question here, right? Is there anything that's important to still learn here? Uh, so I'd like you to turn over to the uh, other side of my little handout. And I won't, you know, I'm not going to read all these things here, but let me just quickly point out that mainstream social scientists, mainstream economists, the business press, uh, they're not all dumb, and they're not all ideologues. Uh, there are very, very smart people out there uh, who buy into capitalism, trying to understand it honestly, and there's a consensus. There's a consensus. You don't read this too much, you don't get a sense of this too much necessarily in the daily paper, but if you read the business press, you get a sense of a growing consensus, there's something really wrong. Something really wrong in the way capitalism is working at this moment in time. So the first, I've got these five, uh, five quotes here. Uh, the first quote's from the Financial Times, and it's a report on an IMF report that came out a couple of weeks ago. The IMF is astounded at the level of debt in the global economy. It can't understand it. It can't understand it, $164 trillion of debt, right? Uh, the public and private sectors deeper in debt than at the height of the financial crisis a decade ago. And so the IMF has no idea about why this has happened. It's just to saying, well, this is weird. We should try to do something about it. We should try to make the debt lower. But they, there's a sense that something's going wrong here. Uh, the second quote uh, from McKinsey and Company Global Institute, probably the most preeminent uh, corporate research think tank. Uh, I'll, I'll read a little of this. Nine years into recovery from the Great Recession, labor productivity growth rates remain near historic lows across many advanced economies. The disconnect between disappearing productivity growth and rapid technological change could not be more pronounced. So that's sort of interesting. A lot of technological change. In the past, technological change would create a spur to capitalist growth, capitalist dynamism. It's not doing that anymore. It's not doing that anymore. And again, the more thoughtful, honest people in the business community, they, they have a sense that something's changed here. It's not working the way it should. If we get a lot of technological change, we should get a lot of economic growth. We're not doing that anymore. The third quote, third quote is from the Financial Times, a recent issue from the Financial Times. And again, they're astounded. They're astounded at the money that corporations are putting into the stock market in terms of stock buybacks. And they're saying, the Financial Times is saying, why isn't this money going to creating jobs? Why isn't this money going into R&D? Why is it all being bought? Why are corporations taking this money and buying their stock back? Right? Uh, this week, since this came out, we found out Apple plans to get, take $100 billion of its profit and buy back its stock with it. If they're not using that money to buy back stock, they're using it to merge with each other. Just last week on Monday, $120 billion was spent on mergers and acquisitions in a 24-hour period. 
Now you read the Financial Times. They ask, why is this happening? This isn't how it's supposed to work. What's going on here? They don't have a real answer about that. They talk about short-termism. Uh, but that's more a question than an answer. Uh, the fourth quote uh, is from The Economist magazine a year or two ago, but things haven't changed, essentially. Uh, and what The Economist tells us is that throughout the history, throughout history, it's been roughly the case that as productivity increased, as gross domestic product increased, real wages would increase more or less in parallel. Uh, in technical Marxian terms, the rate of exploitation was more or less stable, right? So as, as more and more was produced, labor share out of what the social wealth that was produced remained more or less stable. This changed a couple of decades ago, right? This changed a couple of decades ago. Productivity continues to increase, but real wages, as you all know, have stagnated or even declined. And this has been a global phenomenon, right? The U.S., China, you name it. And again, The Economist says, well, this is weird, right? This isn't how it's supposed to work. It's supposed to work that everybody gets a cut as it goes up, right? Maybe not everybody gets the same cut. Maybe it's not even a proportional cut. But everybody's cut more or less stays stable. No more. No more. And then the fifth and last a quote here, it's also from the Financial Times, referring to, again, to a McKinsey Global Institute study. Uh, this is something I didn't know. <laughs> Uh, in the United States today, I don't know how many corporations there are out there, right? There are a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot of firms. Uh, it turns out 10%, only 10% of the companies in the United States get 80% of the profits. The top 20% take home 90% of the profits, right? So that means that 80% of the firms out there are splitting only 10% of the profits among themselves. Now, again, this isn't how capitalism's supposed to work, right? according to the mainstream commentators. So they look at this and they ask, what's going on here? What's going on here? Well, OK, so uh, it seems to me that this points towards something that Marx was right about. It was that capitalism changes in the course of its development that you can't assume that things that held true in the past about capitalism will necessarily hold true today or tomorrow. Uh, environmental crises on a global level are one example of that, right? Because we haven't had a global environmental crisis in capitalism before, <laughs> doesn't mean we're not in one now, right? And so because capitalism had a certain dynamism to it before, that did not require massive amounts of debt in the economy, right? That led to high levels of economic growth, uh, that, that, that allowed real wages to increase. We can't assume any of that continues to hold. Now, Marx talked about this in terms of a tendency for the rate of profit to fall. And he talked about this in terms of something he called an overaccumulation crisis tendency. Uh, and, and these are examples of things that Stephen mentioned that if you start talking about what it meant, it's easy to get lost in Marx's uh, verbiage and so on. Uh, so instead of going through Marx's argument, which is complex and controversial, I just want to give a straightforward, uh, simplistic maybe, uh, argument for why, for why he was right about this. Right? And it goes back to something that we all know. Uh, what we all know is we live in a world today where there are a lot of societies that are very sophisticated technologically. Right? United States has a wonderful national innovation system. It generates a whole stream of innovations. Uh, but Germany's got a good one. Right? England, uh, Japan, South Korea, China increasingly. We live in a world where there's a lot of technological change. Now, in some sense, if you, if you like, you know, I'm not saying technological change has taken a good form, right? From an environmental standpoint, a lot of it hasn't. Uh, but the point here is there was a moment in history where technological change provided some dynamism to capitalism. And I believe there are good reasons to think that moment is over, it's gone, and it's never going to return. And the key thing here is that when we look back in past periods and we ask, where were the periods that were the golden ages of capitalist development? And it turns out that 
they were the periods where there was a technological revolution. The technological revolution gave the capitals in that region a competitive advantage in the world market that lasted for decades and decades and decades. And so because they had this huge competitive advantage from commercializing the innovations that came out of the technological revolution, uh, that encouraged a lot of investment. It, it allowed rates of profit of those capitals, those units of capital, to be very high. Uh, if you have a lot of investment going into a national economy uh, that allowed real wages to increase, you had a golden age. You had a golden age. Now, everything's different today. Everything is different today. If you have some innovation happen in any part of the world that looks like it might be profitable, uh, since all, all sorts of different societies are more or less on the same scientific and technological level, as soon as one firm introduces an innovation that looks like it'll be profitable, firms across the globe will try to jump in, figure out some way to duplicate that innovation, and get a piece of the action. So it's a very simple point here. What matters in capitalism is not innovation, not technological change. What matters is the amount of time you can enjoy a competitive advantage from the innovation. If you enjoy a competitive advantage for the, from the innovation for an extended period of time, you can get high profits for an extended period of time that will encourage high investment for an extended period of time. But if there are, if there are other capitals spread out across the globe that are more or less on the same level as you as a, in, from a scientific and technological standpoint, then the amount of time you can enjoy a competitive advantage in the world market from the innovation is going to shrink and shrink and shrink and shrink. So there will be a tendency for the rate of profit to fall. Another way to make the same point would be uh, we have a capital introduce some innovation at this part of the world. So it has this new dynamic sector all to itself, and it's getting good profits for a while. But all these other capitals on the same level of science and technology want to get a piece of the action. And so they start investing to develop productive capacity in that sector. Well, all of a sudden now, the productive capacity has grown. right? Uh, and so now we're in the situation that Marx called an overaccumulation of capital. What that means is simply that now in even the most dynamic sectors of the economy, there's more productive capacity than markets can absorb. Okay? Now, okay, if, if that makes some sense, let's go back and look at those quotes again. Now, if you live in a world where in the technologically dynamic sectors, there's problems about too much capacity in those sectors, that's a problem for capitalism because it's making an investment to develop that productive capacity, but now there's no outlet for it. There's no market for it. Now, capital in the past has reacted to that situation with the Great Depression and destroyed productive capacity. But the problem is a global depression on the scale that would be required to overcome this problem now would be unimaginably horrific. And political leaders have not wanted to go down that path. So they've stumbled into other ways for capital to go forward and not have a Great Depression to destroy all that excess productive capacity. Well, how can you do it? Well, if you can break away from gold and you can have the dominant form of world money be the dollar, a pure fiat currency that the Federal Reserve can create and the financial sector can create in infinite amounts, well, what can you do? you can have an explosion of credit, an explosion of credit to governments, to households, to, to businesses. If you have an explosion of credit, what does that do? It allows some productive capacity that would otherwise have to be destroyed, otherwise could not be used profitably. If you can put more money into people's hands by building up debt, then some of that excess productive capacity can be absorbed. Right? And it all rests on the dynamic that Marx described. 
the overaccumulation dynamic, the falling rate of profit dynamic, explains that first quote. It explains what the IMF can't explain, which is why at this moment in time, capitalism needs debt to explode to unimaginable amounts. Right? If that didn't happen, we'd be in a Great Depression. And so they have to keep expanding and expanding and expanding the amount of debt in the economy. The second quote, however much they expand the debt in the global economy, all that can do is keep us out of a depression. If in all the sectors of the world market there's already a danger of too much productive capacity, then you can create all the debt you want and it's not going to lead to massive investment into new productive capacity because there's already too much productive capacity. So you can create all this debt and only have a flatline global rate of growth. We can have all this technological change and it's not going to increase economic growth because it's not technological change that gives the dynamism to capital. It's being able to enjoy the profits from technical change for an extended period of time. And that's gone. Right? That's gone. So we can explain in this framework the second, that second thing from the quote. Uh, the, third, the third thing on that list, same sort of point. Companies are making all this profit, but if they're operating in sectors that is already faces this incredible danger of too much productive capacity, Right? Uh, what are they going to do with their money? Well, it turns out you can make more profit. You can, it's better for capital if they take that money and do it, engage in stock buybacks, engage in mergers and acquisitions, engage in things that allow the, the value of financial assets to keep increasing. Because then, that's better for investors. They can make more money. If you buy Apple stock before the $100 billion buyback, then Apple will give you $100 billion right, in return for that stock. Or you can hold on to your stock. And after Apple buys up uh, some stock with its $100 billion, what's left is going to be worth more. So in terms of M going to M prime, in terms of investment money going to a greater return on capital, it turns out that in, in our historical moment, it makes more sense to do that through financial speculation than it does in investing in the so-called real economy. Uh, well, why is that? Well, it's because we're in, we are in a moment in time where there is a tendency for the rate of profit to fall and for capitalism to be beset with major problems of overaccumulation, uh, excess productive capacity, right? That can explain why, that can explain why the financial sector goes so crazy. Uh, we, we can twiddle with that if we want, we can regulate that if we want, but if we take away that way for capital to, to accumulate, capital's going to be in big problems, a big problem. Uh, the fourth point holds the same, same sort of point. Uh, if you're in a world where technological change gives you a huge competitive advantage in the world market so that you can make a high rate of profits, uh, you'll have a high rate of investment, uh, you can be generous enough and give your workers an increase in real wages. If you live in a world where, in every major sector of the world economy, there's so much excess productive capacity, uh, and the amount of time you can get from an innovation is shrinking and shrinking and shrinking, uh, that, that moment of generosity is gone. And if you want to get profits in a world like that, you need an ongoing, relentless, and endless war against labor. Right? You need to figure out some way uh, to shift the balance of power between labor and capital in capital's favor. Technology is a great weapon to do that. Uh, globalization is another mechanism to do that. Uh, you, have, you have to create de 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 depressionary forces on wages to maintain profit levels or even get profit increases uh, in a world where innovation isn't going to give you that anymore. And then the fifth thing on this list is, of course, you can live in a world where there are all these regions out there more or less on the same level of science and technology. If you increase the scale and scope of the intellectual property rights system, then you can still enjoy high profits for an extended period of time, uh, even if other units of capital out there in the world can duplicate your innovation without too much difficulty. And so it's been a huge geopolitical agenda of the United States to, in, to increase the intellectual property rights system in the world market uh, in scale and enforcement. Uh, okay, 
that makes sense for capital to do at this historic moment? Capital has to do that, in a way, at this historical moment. But of course, it comes at the pathological consequence of not being good for the dynamism of capitalism as a whole. Right? It's great for that 10% of companies that has most of the intellectual property. Uh, that's what the Financial Times says, right? Who are these companies? Who are these 10% of companies that are getting 80% of the profits? They're the companies with intellectual property. Right? So again, again, the point here is the thing that allows capital to keep going here is not going to be a thing that generates creative dynamism for the system as a whole. Because the a fourth thing that Marx got right is whatever creative energies, whatever creative dynamism capitalism had at the beginning of its historical run, uh, that's running out of steam. And it's our fortune or misfortune to be living at the moment where it's bumping against these limits, these historical limits. All right, so uh, the only other point I wanted to make uh, has to do with uh, point five on my handout here, which is if you buy this, uh, where do we go from here? And I just want to talk about this a little bit because uh, this is the thing that a lot of people get wrong about Marx um, because a lot of people talk about Marx without having actually read him too much and it's also one of the, you know, one of the unfortunate legacies of the Stalinist tradition. Uh, most people, a lot of people at least, still think that Marx called for some sort of authoritarian system of self-appointed elites who lived privileged lifestyles and got to make decisions about everything in the economy for everybody else. Uh, and that sort of system is totalitarian, it's authoritarian, and it's economically inefficient. The top-down central planning turns out to be a disaster. So why would we take Marx seriously today, 200 years after his birth, uh, when even if he got this point right or that point right, what it all comes down to is advocating for a type of system that was tried and obviously failed miserably. So again, Marx would be of only historical interest because how can anybody who advocated a system like the Soviet Union, in, which imploded and failed, uh, why should we pay too much attention to his thoughts about much of anything? Okay, so I just want to point out if you hadn't had a chance to read it yet, there are very few texts where Marx actually anticipates what a post-capitalist society might look like, what a socialist society might look like. Uh, the, one that, the one where he talked about it the most is uh, his essay on the Paris Commune. And he called the Paris Commune, the, this is almost a direct quote, I won't get it quite right, but he said something like, the Paris Commune shows us the political form in which the self-emancipation of the working class could take place. So when he says something like that, we should pay attention to how he describes it. And for, as you'll see from this quote from that, from that article there, Marx insisted everyone exercising any type of authority has to be elected, has to be subject to recall, and has to be only paid average workers' wages. So there's a very easy test for any society whether it really should be called the sort of society that Marx would have approved of. Is everybody who holds authority elected? Is everybody subject to recall? Is everybody paid only average workers' wages? Well, as far as I'm concerned, this just immediately rules out the Soviet Union being called a Marxist society. I mean, they can call themselves a Marxist society, but we, sh we shouldn't take that seriously because the people who ran that society, they weren't elected, they weren't subject to recall, and they weren't paid average workers' wages. So that was not the sort of society Marx talked about. Right? That was not the sort of society that he, that he wanted. Uh, what, what he wanted was not to abolish democracy, but to extend democracy. Right? So the main point here is we live in a society that has depoliticized deeply political questions. And so what we call politics turns out to be a very impoverished form of politics. Right? So from Marx's standpoint, the question of how society should reproduce itself is an inherently political question. The question of what purpose should social reproduction serve is an inherently political question. We leave these questions unasked because social reproduction happens automatically through the circulation of commodities and money, and the purpose it serves 
is also unasked or unthought about. The purpose it serves is the accumulation of capital as an alien end in themselves. We take those questions out of politics and put them in this separate sphere called economics. Right? But they're deeply, they're deeply political questions. And because, we've, because the most deep political questions we've dismissed from politics, then what we call the political realm is impoverished. It's impoverished. We can talk about this policy and that policy, but we can't talk about what the purpose of social life is and how it's something more than just the endless accumulation of money as an end in itself. So again, if you have a chance to read this quote at the bottom of this page, that's the point of it, right? The point is that it's, the point is if you want to dismiss Marx, then come up with some reasons, come up with some arguments about why what he said wasn't true. <laughs> uh, don't just dismiss him automatically because you think he advocated for some non-democratic type of society. He advocated for a society where every exercise of authority is subject to the consent of those over whom the authority is exercised. And he was smart enough to know that that means workplaces should be seen as political communities and places where authority is exercised and should therefore be subject to the consent of those over whom it's exercised. So I guess those are the five points I wanted to make. There's a lot more that we could talk about and maybe it can come up later, but I wanted to stay roughly within the time constraints. So thank you very much for your attention and for a great day. Uh, yes. Uh, well, of course, uh, Marx would have thought uh, 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 you know, universal basic income was something uh, we should advocate and call for. Uh, I think what he would say, though, is uh, we should not have delusions about uh, its possibility within our type of society. Uh, now, as a lot of you know, very mainstream people are now beginning to advocate this. Again, The Economist has talked about it. You can read essays in the Financial Times that talk about it. Uh, and again, it goes back to this general unease uh, among the more honest commentators in, in capitalism that there's something different now, there's something weird going on that they're trying to get a handle on. Uh, people are afraid of the depressionary pressure that's going to be put on wages uh, from the robot revolution, from advances in artificial intelligence. Uh, people know that they're not going to eliminate all jobs, but it's going to like, take away a lot of well-paying, jo good-paying jobs, and it's going to create a lot of labor supply and poor-paying poor jobs. And people are worried that capitalism might ha not have enough aggregate demand in it. There might not be enough demand uh, for its products anymore. Uh, in capitalism, it's not enough to produce commodities. You have to sell them. Uh, and if the depressionary pressure on wages is so great, uh, who's going to buy your products? Uh, well, uh, one answer is a universal basic income, and it's seen as a way to uh, save capitalism from itself in a, in a way. The problem is, the problem is, uh, capitalism requires, as I said before, it requires a working class that is coerced to sell its labor power, right, uh, to people who have money capital in order to uh, create more profit for them, right? So, when you, when you think about a universal basic income in that context, it seems to me one of two things is going to happen. It's either going to be at such a low level, it's not going to really be able to provide for a meaningful life of human dignity for everybody. 
right? And it's not going to be really able to solve capitalist problem with aggregate demand. Uh, or it's going to be at such a high level it can deal with those problems, but then it will shift the balance of power between capital and labor in labor's favor uh, to the point where capital will say, no, no, we, 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 don't, we don't want this. We can't let this happen. So I think it's good to advocate for a ba universal basic income, but I think it's one of these things that has uh, a political dynamic that points beyond capitalism. Right? It seems a reasonable thing to want. It seems a reasonable thing to struggle for. But it, in the course of struggling for it, I think people are going to come to the realization capitalism can't give it to us. So we struggle for it while thinking it's going to take us beyond it. That's my view. <laughs> OK. Next question. What would you say to economists who claim that this notion of capital as an alien power is mystical? Yeah. Well, that, no, that's a, that's a good question. It's not just uh, mainstream economists. A lot of Marxists uh, also say that. Uh, okay, so uh, this gets into complicated questions about how you view uh, metaphysics and the world and all that stuff. Um, so my view is, my view is that uh, there are a level of material reality, right? And we can understand the level of material reality in very elementary ways uh, that physics teaches us. Uh, but then material reality gets organized in increasingly complex ways. And it doesn't mean we introduce some mystical thing to explain it. But as we have more and more complex ways of organizing the world, uh, we need more and more complex <coughs> concepts, right? So for me, uh, there's a sense in which, of course, uh, human, uh, all, all living beings can be reduced to uh, you know, atoms in motion or whatever, subatomic particles in motion, whatever. You can do that, right? But you're not going to really be able to explain what biology explains with just the categories of physics, right? And we can keep going up and up and up. And there's a sense in which, sure, right? It's all ultimately a matter of what's going on on the subatomic level, sure, right? But again, if we want to explain the world, and the world is the organization of matter on increasingly complex levels, we're going to need increasingly complex categories to explain that. So it seems to me that it is true that capital is nothing but the social relations that organize us in a world of generalized commodity production, generalized commodity exchange. Capital isn't anything, anything different from that. But because we have a social world organized in that way, rather than the way it was organized in feudalism or whatever, we, something, something has emerged, right? A higher, a higher order of reality has emerged. And we need some higher order category to describe that. Uh, and I think Marx had it right. We need, we need a concept of capital. We need a concept of capital. It is, capital is part of our social world, right? Our social world isn't just the table, the chair, the person sitting next to you, the car outside, right? All those things make up our social world too, but they're all organized in a way, they're all organized in a way that there's a higher order purpose behind so much of human action, right? The higher order purpose is we need money, <laughs> and so we have to somehow fit ourselves into some circuit that is leading to capital go from money to more money, uh, and that that's a reality. And so we need a, and, and that the society as a whole is organized by that principle, right? It's organized by that principle, uh, and that there's a unity to this process. Uh, and if there's a unity to it, then even if it couldn't exist without the existence of the lower level, in my metaphysics, that doesn't make it mystical to say we need a concept of capital, right? It's an emergent level with its own emergent properties, its emergent tendencies. Uh, and if we don't have a concept of capital, we'll miss all that. Um, but, I, but these things are controversial. <laughs> uh. Great. Um, we have a lot of questions, so I'm going to maybe try to pull the ones that are similar. Um, these are three questions that I would say um, have to do with um, um, social democratic reforms. So um, this one is basically asking, um, how do you respond to advocating for a new Keynesian style of social democratic reforms to regulate and improve capitalism 
or um, um, or is this basically not a useful idea? And then um, this question is asking, um, do you feel how like basically how do you feel about public-private partnerships? To um, sorry, I'm um, uh, like is, is this a way to um, stem capitalism, or does it? Um, basically further extend capitalism's life. Um, and then this is asking about um, your opinion, or how do we overcome the force of the notion of small business in American political imagination, um, and how it limits ordinary people from challenging capitalism? Yeah, uh, all tough questions, of course. Um, Okay, so the, 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 the reformist thing of Keynesianism and social democracy, uh, that of course is a, is a huge issue. I tried to get at a little bit in talking about the state in my talk and then a little bit in talking about the universal basic income idea. Uh, it's, it seems to me there are certain categories of reforms that are just not compatible with capitalism. So you can have, I mean, it, back in feudalism, there were more and less humane aristocratic lords, de ways they dealt with their serfs, right? Some were really brutal to their serfs, some were not so brutal. In slavery societies, some slave masters were brutal and some were not brutal at all. Uh, it seems to me in capitalism, it can cover a range of phenomenon. There are very brutal forms of capitalism and there are some forms of capitalism that aren't so brutal. Uh, any human being <laughs> should support reforms to make capitalism be as little brutal, <laughs> as little brutality in it as possible. We should support that. Uh, but just like, right, just like there's no possible reform of feudalism that could correct for the fundamental problem of one person claiming to be a lord and another person being stuck being a serf. And one, in slave societies, there's no reform that could, that could make, get rid of the problem of one person claiming a right to own another person as a slave. Uh, it seems to me that when you understand the way capitalism works, there's just certain limits to what's reasonable to, to, to ask it to be able to reform. It can't reform the basic principle that the society is going to be directed towards capital's good and it will sacrifice the good of human beings whenever that seems necessary to further capital good. There's no reform that's going to change that and there's no reform that's going to get rid of the coercion uh, of people having to go work for capital and give up most of their waking adult life to making profit for capital, right? Capital has too many weapons to stop that from happening, right? It can go on a capital strike. It can, make, it can turn the economy into chaos. If you want to change that, then you're going to have to take away the economic power of the capitalist class, right? So, so it seems to me this is the fundamental problem with Keynesianism, right? That, that it, it has an illusion that we could somehow have some magic law passed uh, that would make capital serve human ends and human flourishing, right? Some magic law passed that could create some complete equality between the capitalist and the wage labor. I don't see that happening, right? That's why I'm a Marxist and not a Keynesian, right? Now, it's not like when it comes to particular reforms, I don't want all the same reforms they call for, but again, it seems to me there are some reforms that capital can give us, and there are some reforms that go outside the framework of what is possible in capitalism. And I think we need to read Marx to start thinking about that difference. Because we're bumping against the limits of uh, you know, our historical moment. I think there's not going to be too much scope for reform, right? The war on labor isn't going to go away anytime soon. Uh, the environmental crisis isn't going to go away anytime soon. Uh, all these things, if we want to deal with them adequately today, we have to really start thinking about what, what the limits of capital are. Uh, now, again, that's a massive, a massive uh, issue, but uh, that's, that's my view, but that's, I guess you could probably have guessed that. Uh, in terms of the public-private partnership thing, I mean, boy, when I hear that word, I, I get... <laughs> I mean, that's what Iowa State is, right? What that means is we socialize the cost for business so to allow it to appropriate private profit, right? That's what private-public pro private partnerships means, right? The, the big lie of capitalism, and this is the big lie, capital B, capital L, right? That it's all about private investors risking their private capital, and they deserve the reward they get because they're so bold in taking these risks. 
Well, it turns out that's just a complete lie, right? It turns out they don't want to take the investments that are really the risky ones, really the important ones, right? Uh, now, again, I talked about technical change today. Technical change doesn't come out of thin air. Innovations don't come out of thin air. Innovations come out of decades and decades and decades of investment in basic research and long-term research and development. And capital doesn't want any part of that. Right? Because they don't know if there'll ever be a commercializable result from it. They don't know how long it will take to get that commercializable result. It could be decades and decades and decades. They don't know if they, there are commercializable results, if there'll be any market demand for it. They don't know if there is market demand for it, if they'll get a good cut. There's just too much cost and too much risk in being halfway rational. They don't want to do it. And so they say, well, let's have a public-private partnership. And let's have the public, let's have the public socialize the, they don't use this word, they don't use the S word. Uh, but let's have public funding of basic research and in long-term research and development. And then a couple of decades down the road, when it actually turns out to be viable, we will slap 1,000 private property rights on it, 1,000 intellectual property rights on it. And the 10% of companies that get to do that the quickest uh, will be able to get 80% of the profits. And the public that invested in the technology is now at the mercy of these monopoly companies that now have state sanctioned, right? The coercive powers of the state granting this monopoly in the form of intellectual property rights. Uh, I mean, to me, that's what public-private partnerships mean. <laughs> uh, and that's not socialism, right? That, that's not socialism. And of course, just to add one little, little point to that, uh, it always turns out to be the case. Always is overstated, of course. <laughs> That's my tragic flaw to overstate things. But most of the time, it turns out to be the case that the people holding the intellectual property and appropriating the profits that were eventually go back to public funds, they're not the ones who are engaged in the innovation process. right? Because the men and women actually doing the innovation, in most cases, the very first thing they do is sign away their, their intellectual property rights to their company or sign their intellectual property rights away to the university or whatever. Uh, so, so this is not necessary to, to spur innovation because the people doing the innovation are not the ones benefiting primarily from it. This is necessary for capital to make profit in a world where it no longer gets profit from just having an innovation because it can't enjoy a competitive advantage from the innovation for very long. Uh, so it has to uh, move towards the intellectual property rights system. Uh, so at any rate, uh, there are other examples of private-public -private, uh, private partnerships, but at the end of the day, I think they all come down to socializing capital's costs so that it can privatize its return. There was a third one that I forget. <laughs> uh, it's like small business. Small business. Okay, yeah, small business. Uh, well, all, all, the, all, all the people I read um, don't have a big problem with small business, right? So, so when we talk about socializing an economy, it doesn't necessarily mean getting rid of every local farmer's market thing where you can bring something to a local market to sell. Uh, you know, uh, democratizing the economy means you look at the decisions that are matters of the political community as a whole and you democratize those decisions. Uh, so I think there's a continu uh, you know, I think that any halfway uh, reasonable socialist society would leave room for some, some small businesses on, on a, operating on a local level. Uh, I don't see any problem with that myself. Uh, there should be some rule, right? Um, obviously to prevent exploitation of people within a family. <laughs> uh, and also there's probably some limit of people you, you can have work for you. Uh, it, it's, a, it's, a, it's a question, right? It would it'd be a matter for a society to decide. How many people have to work together before we're going to say, uh, this is a political community. And as a political community, anybody exercising authority there should be subject to the consent of, of those over whom it's being exercised. Uh, you know, that will still leave some scope for businesses that fit our model. Okay, so here I have three questions about technology. Um, the first one asks, do you think there are any consistent features of companies that have captured long-ish term increasing profits. And these examples they give are Apple, Amazon, and Facebook. The second asks, um, because technology change does not yield high profits anymore, <clears throat> um, has this encouraged firms to merge, to pull profits together? <clears throat> Excuse me. 
And then the third asks, within a Marxist framework, does socialized full automation have the potential to free us from capitalism's limitations and exploitations? Okay, hey, can I keep this? Just so I can... Yes. It. Yeah, good. Uh, boy, these are tough. <laughs> uh, okay, uh, well, okay, so um, the examples that were given, Apple, Facebook, and so on, uh, these exactly fit this model of companies that rest upon decades of public funding in, in, in innovation and computer science, and then relatively late in the process slap a ton of intellectual property rights, and so they do become incredibly profitable. So the point isn't that it isn't still possible to make profits from innovation, it's just it's not the innovation that gets you the profits anymore, it's the intellectual property rights that get you the profit. Uh, and of course, Apple is like a wonderful case of all this. There, there's a really great book by a woman named Maria Mazzucato called The Entrepreneurial State that talks about Apple in particular. Uh, Apple's great creative intelligence was to integrate core technologies into a design that consumers found really attractive and easy to use. That was a great achievement. Uh, but it integrated 12 core technologies, and all 12 core technologies were developed in whole or part with public money. Uh, so Apple gets this tremendous return uh, for slapping intellectual property rights onto it at the end of the process. So uh, has this, okay, so, all right, that's a point. Uh, because technical change does not yield high profits anymore, is this encourage firms to merge and pool profits together? Uh, sure, sure, yes. Um, Yes, uh, two firms getting a low rate of profit. If you can merge them together, lay off a fair amount of workers, uh, cut down some of your research and development spending, uh, then you can raise your rate of profit. So yes, that's, uh, that's a very good point to make and keep in mind. Uh, okay, uh, do you think there are consistent features of companies that have captured longest terms increasing profits? Okay, uh, that was the first, the first question, yeah. And the feature is they claim intellectual property rights. Yeah, that's the common feature. <laughs> they have vast armies of corporate lawyers uh, to, to protect their intellectual property and uh, defend it. Um, there was a year, a couple, there was a year or two back where Apple and Google spent more on defending, appropriating, and defending intellectual property than they did on research on new products. Uh, which again isn't how capitalism is supposed to work if you read the textbooks, uh, but it's the way capitalism at this moment in time is increasingly working. Uh, for reasons that I think Marx uh, anticipated. All right, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. <laughs> sorry, Lisa. There was the one about the, the automation thing, and yes, of course, yes. Uh, in capitalism, automation is going to have this incredible de de deflationary pressure on wages effect. That's not caused by the technology, right? That's caused by the social relationships of capital. Uh, if you increase, if you have some technology that can increase productivity by 20%, society has a choice, right? You can either fire 20% of your workers, right? Uh, or you can keep everybody at the same standard of living and have them all work 20% less, right? Now, one's the default option for how technology would be used in capitalism, and the other is the default option we should want. These two, I think, they're somewhat related. Uh, the first asks, how do you relieve the stigma of communist fascism for those who are misinformed? And the second asks, will capitalism naturally fall, or do we have to change our relationship to the means of production ourselves through revolution? Uh, oh, oh. <laughs> man. <laughs> we could be here for months and months and months to do these <laughs> adequately. Uh, okay, well, uh, in terms of correcting the myth against Marx, uh, you have this quote here. Keep it. <laughs> put it in your scrapbook. Reproduce it. Put it at the end of your email. <laughs> uh, so that's one thing you could do. Uh, a second thing you could do, this came up in an early discussion today. Uh, this, is, this is a fun question to ask the person next to you at a bar or whatever. Not, not that you go to bars. Uh, okay, in the last couple of hundred years, uh, there have been vicious right-wing governments, fascist governments that have made it their goal to kill as many Marxists as possible, right? Hitler's goal, Mussolini's goal, uh, Franco's goal, P uh, Pinochet's goal. Who executed more Marxists than anybody else in history? Stalin. You just look at the numbers. Stalin executed more Marxists than anybody else. So, why did he do that? 
Well, because most of the people who made the Russian Revolution did not want, did, didn't make it to get Stalinism. Right? They wanted something different. Now, whether they could have had it, the historical explanations, it gets complicated, sure. Uh, but the point is, right, there, were, there was a whole generation of Marxists that didn't want to go down the path Stalin was going down, or Stalin was afraid they wouldn't want the path he was going down, and he had them all killed. So, I mean, there's a couple of things you can say, right? The, the, the point from that quote is, uh, it, it, what you think is Marxism. Did it have everybody who had authority? Was, were they elected? Were they subject to recall? Were they paid average work wages? Well, then why are you calling it Marxist, right? And, but the second thing is, the society you think is Marxist was responsible for more deaths of Marxists <laughs> than any other society. Uh, so there should be a, that should create a little cognitive dissonance there, right? Uh, and then the other rhetorical point is just that, like every term in political philosophy, Marxism is incredibly ambiguous, and lots of people get to talk about it and define it in different ways. So for me, the great analogy would be Christianity, right? So think of all the societies that called themselves Christian, right? Societies that were based on genocide, societies that were based on pomegranates, societies that were based on, uh, you know, the fasc fascist societies called themselves Christians, right? Uh, now. I didn't, I didn't find anything in the Gospels that justified fascism. <laughs> uh, and yet, these societies called themselves Christian societies. I don't find anything in Stalinism that fits my understanding of Marx. But they got to call themselves Marxists. But just because they get to use the term, why should we go along with it? So that's not going to really convince anybody because it's an incredibly powerful rhetorical move. Um, we just have to outweigh, the, outweigh maybe that generation that instinctively, when you say Marxist, thinks of Stalinism. Okay. Um, <laughs> I think the same person asked for you too. They're very good. Um, <laughs> when I find that person. Speaking <laughs> of social reproduction, can you outline how the devaluation of feminized labor is required by capital? Yeah. It seems that capital relies on the exploitation of women as far as child rearing and domestic labor. Yeah. The second one asks, can you speak to the role of US imperialism in keeping capital accumulation going? Um, does it give us that extra time frame of competitive advantage that you spoke of? And you didn't answer the one about revolution. Oh, I didn't answer the one about revolution. <laughs> Getting too many cards here. Uh, yeah. Uh, will capitalism naturally fall? No. <laughs> uh, capitalism could go forever. There's no, there's no condition of de so degraded capitalism couldn't continue to function, <laughs> in my view. Uh, so it will only be ended politically or it won't be ended, uh, is my view. Um, do we have to change our relationship to the means of production ourselves through revolution? Uh, well, revolutions, uh, well, the answer is yes, we have to change our relation to the means of production. Uh, and that goes back to what I said before about extending Marxism is really about extending the realm of the political so that we realize how the society's means of production are used and what purpose they serve. We define that as a political question rather than a depolitical question. So, so, so we do have to change our relationship to the means of production. Now, whether that has to happen through revolution, uh, revolution is, uh, it, 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 it turns out that if, a, if Societies that have looked unbelievably stable from the outside have often turned out to be houses of, uh, houses of cards that have not taken too much to blow over, right? So the Soviet Union itself, the CIA thought it was a totalitarian society that had such a grip on the society, it wasn't going anywhere ever. <laughs> and then you wake up one day and it's basically gone, right? Well, what brought it down? Uh, well, we tend to forget, but what brought it down was millions of people walking in the street calling for some sort of democratic type of socialism. Uh, now, that, that, you know, that, get, that gets distorted and lost, but it turns out it wasn't such a stable system, and it didn't take a lot of violence to bring it down. Uh, when I was a kid, the Shah of Iran looked like this a mighty, powerful figure, right? The, the biggest secret police in the world and the second biggest spending on the army in the world, whatever. Uh, it turned out that that regime was very uh, fragile and uh, you know, imploded more or less from within. Now, again, it didn't turn out well. <laughs> uh, but, that, but that societies can change quicker and faster and with less violence than anybody could have foreseen uh, 
has, seems like a patent in history or a possibility in history. So I don't know what's going to happen in the future. But it does seem to me that the fact that there are so many peop young people here shows that there's a lot more and more people who, who are realizing something is wrong. Uh, those quotes I have from the financial press is, is, conveys a sense that people will sort of have some general realization here. This system isn't working the way it's supposed to, right? It's, it's not creating what it's supposed to create. It's, it's, it's energy seem to be coming against uh, walls, hitting into walls. Uh, if, that, if that view were widespread on a subterranean level, uh, it might not take much for people to say, OK, <laughs> let's try something else. Um, one last point. We already had the complete and utter implosion of the financial system, right? Uh, there was not a single firm, not a single financial firm in the United States in 2008 that was solvent, right? For every financial firm, their liabilities stayed the same and their assets had been tremendously devalued. They were all insolvent. The global, the global system, through central banks, quantitative easing, artificially low interest rates, they injected $25 trillion into the global economy to bail out the financial sector. You want to know how social change could happen without a revolution? Just wait for the financial system to implode again, as it will. It will. Right? Just let it go. And take the $25 trillion that central banks created and put it into local community banks and say, you can allocate it to worker co-ops in your region that, that, that talk to your community, figure out what the plans are, what the big social needs are in that community, and as community banks, start funding those co-ops that can meet the needs of your community. And then have them meet on higher level, regional levels, national levels, work out some sort of democratic idea about how to get a society going forward again. Uh, <laughs> That wouldn't take anybody killing anybody. It would, it, would just, it would just be not bailing out capital from its own insanity, right? Uh, I mean, that, that'd be how I would like it to go. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, is, did we get to everything? <laughs> OK, can I speak to the role of US imperialism keeping capital accumulation going? Does it give us that extra time frame of competitive advantage that you spoke of? Uh, yes. Uh, well, the competitive, time the competitive advantage is now coming from intellectual property. Uh, again, maintaining and extending the intellectual property rights system has been the number one U.S. non-military objective for decades, where the Democratic regimes, Republican regimes, doesn't matter. This has been at the top of the list. Uh, and the reason for that exactly is we still have the, maybe the best national innovation system, at least for a while longer. Other ones are really good in catching up, but if we can slap intellectual property on all the crucial technologies, we can maintain our dominant position in the global economy uh, for another period. Uh, so that's certainly the case. Um, to me, that's a form of imperialism. Uh, all of this de uh, depends on the dollar still being world money, right? Uh, everything about the health of the United States economy, quote unquote, uh, depends upon the dollar maintaining its status as world money, in my view. Uh, it's only the United States that can create an infinite amount of money of credit and debt uh, with as few uh, ramifications uh, because the dollar is world money. Uh, what can we do to maintain the value of the dollar as world money? <laughs> uh, we can make sure that the, the, the commodities that matter most, oil, weapons uh, are priced in dollars. Um, if you're going to have the crucial commodities in the world market priced in dollars, then you have to make sure you can back that up with force as need be. So yeah, I mean, it's a huge story outside the context of my talk. But uh, behind, behind all the economic flows of capital investment, there's always the, the iron fist somewhere lurking behind. Uh, but again, that would be another topic for a long time. OK, so we have one last question. Can modern monetary theory be a helpful way to talk about debt right now? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> All right, can I, can I just do a little explanation? So the traditional view is 
Uh, banks get savings, right? There again, there were these heroic people that instead of like the rest of us, we foolishly spend money on food and stuff like that. Uh, but they make the sacrifice of saving and, and they put their money in the banks and then the banks uh, figure out who the people are who have the best investment ideas and they funnel the money to the investors. Uh, so saving is the main thing that keeps the system going. Uh, modern monetary theory explains why that's false and that a money is initially created out of nothing. Uh, and I think that's true. Uh, and if that's true, it opens all sorts of possibilities for social control of the economy uh, that just wouldn't be there if uh, money flows depended upon the wealthy saving. If you think about the world in terms of everything depends upon how much the rich want to save and invest, uh, then, we're, then they can basically blackmail us to get the world they want. Uh, if we think of this social power that money is uh, being a collectively created project, right? Something collectively created by a, a political process, then it opens up a whole range of possibilities for social life uh, that, that socialism is part of. Uh, so yes, I think modern monetary theory is very important. What about social reproduction? Yeah. What about social what? There was a question about social reproduction. Social reproduction, okay. Oh, oh yes, of course. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> yes. Uh, well, I began. Remember, I began by saying <laughs> we shouldn't overemphasize how much uh, you know that we should look for Marx for answers to everything. So this is a realm that is neglected in Marx. Uh, it, there are hints of it, but not not developed enough. There's a long tradition of socialist feminism uh, that comes after Marx and is very important to supplement what Marx gives us. Uh, Again, it seems to me capitalism rests on a whole series of lies, right? So one lie is the big lie that uh, innovation comes from investors taking risks. Uh, the other big lie is that capitalism is a society that's based on everybody pursuing their private self-interest. And the big lie there is capitalism, like other types of societies, have completely depended on uh, the altruistic care labor, right? Uh, labor that isn't done out of self-interest in return for a wage, right? Uh, and that is, in, again, predominantly done by women. And so the whole social system, right, depends on care labor in, in the clearest possible sense, right? Uh, again, that's undeveloped in Marx's thought. And so when we're talking about what Marx got right, we can't really spend a lot of time talking about that. But that's something that's really, really important to say. So we certainly have to supplement Marx's theory of capital uh, with the socialist feminist theory of uh, domestic labor and care labor and its role in social reproduction. So no, no question about that. Thank you very much. Oh. You. <laughs> so of our banks, we have a gift for you. Ah. <laughs> Whoa. The life and works of Karl Marx. Thank you very much. Yeah. Wow. I'm touched. <laughs>